Okay, so it's been a while since we have talked about the Vancouver Canucks and their winger situation. And there have been a few names that have inserted themselves into the conversation that we actually haven't highlighted on this channel as much, too. Unfortunately, I don't make Canucks videos every single day like I used to because at this time in the offseason, there are just so many things you have to dig into to try to sustain yourself. You know, I'm in the business of making videos full time and it's my thing, so... Trying to exhaust all the topics in one go is not the smartest idea, thus the rotating around to different teams, etc, etc. And besides, we're not really in a rush to cover stuff anyway, so we have ourselves a bigger time frame to talk about these things. Either way, let's go over the Vancouver Canucks and their winger situation once more. And to help us out in this video, we're heading over onto an article on The Province published by PJ Patrick Johnston earlier last week. August 17th, this is what he wrote about Canucks, what's left to do for Patrick Alvine on his list before training camp. It's still a month away for the Canucks, but there is no time to rest. The entire premise of this video that I wanted to pull from with this article is the health checks and a discussion circulating around both Tucker Pullman and Tanner Pearson, how they both finished the season on the LTIR, Pullman with serious migraine issues, and Pearson dealing with serious post-operative complications from what was supposed to be a simple surgical repair to his left hand. Now, we've talked this entire season about Pearson and his injuries, and we had some weird updates in there as to how the recovery of his hand was going. There were some shady comments thrown around by Quinn Hughes that could have or could not have alluded to the competency of the Canucks and their medical staff. But included in this article actually is a picture of Pearson at the end of season press conference with his hand in... I don't know what that is. Is that a brace? I'm not necessarily too sure if that's the right word. But either way, recent updates, especially like the ones from Patrick Alvine, say that Pearson will apparently take part in training camp next month. Last week, we had ourselves check TV's Rick Dollywall saying that things are indeed looking up for Tanner Pearson. He said this during the interview on Sakaris and Price. And so with Tanner Pearson actually being an apparent option here for the Vancouver Canucks in 23-24, you gotta go out there and start questioning things. Okay, if Pearson comes back, what are you getting? Hopefully you're getting a bit more than 5 points in 14 games played, and hopefully you're getting a tad more out of what you'd seen out of Pearson towards the start of his Vancouver Canucks career. I think a lot of people might remember this, but when Pearson was acquired by Vancouver in the one-for-one one Eric and Branson trade with the Penguins, Pearson popped off at the end of the 18-19 year. 12 points, 19 games played, for the Vancouver Canucks, 9 goals, 3 assists, and then the season after that, hey, sure, it was a shortened year due to the virus breaking out, but 45 points in 69 games played, that's on pace for about, what is that, 50-ish points and a boatload of goals too? Pearson then started to decline heavily the next season. 21-22, he bounced back, 34 points, 68 games played. And at this point in his career, he was getting beaten out by other wingers. He was becoming more so of a defensive guy, strictly on the boards, kind of more of a two-way player instead of just an offensive guy. And you really started to see sort of the Louis Erickson transformation take itself in with Pearson and his game. That's not to say that Pearson is no longer an effective player. I mean, he's been out the entire year pretty much. But if he does come back, if he is fully healthy, if his hand is able to play an 82-game NHL season, the question is still sort of there. Hey, what are we going to get? We don't really know. More so of a two-way guy, does his offensive touch come back? He's going to have to beat out some pretty significant wingers on the Canucks if he wants to get a top six spot. But there really are more questions than answers here with Pearson. We just kind of have to wait and see where things go. The article goes out there and brings up Pearson's name as a potential stirring the pot type of thing, or the spoon, excuse me, as a potential spoon in stirring the pot to other winger discussions. Which winger is out? PJ goes out there and writes. If Pearson can't go this season, this is a little bit less of a pressing issue, and other injuries could emerge. But as it stands, there isn't enough space for all of Pud Colson, Garland, Besser, and Hoaglander in the lineup. This isn't just a cap space issue. As it stands, the Canucks will have to find about $1 million in cap space if Pearson isn't on the LTIR, but Pullman is. It's about lineup space. 
Between the second and the third line, three of these four wingers will have a spot. The fourth will certainly be a scratch. And if Pearson can play, that's five wingers for three spots. You always want to have as many options as possible over a long season, but you have to start the season cap compliant. Waving Pearson and reassigning him to start the year in Abbey would be one way to do so, but you're still scratching one of the other four. There's little doubt Alvin and his staff have gamed out their situation. How the wingers are handled ahead of training camp and going through camp will be something to watch. And we've made a few videos talking about this entire thing, how all the wingers on the team clog everybody else up, and it's going to be difficult to find out who amongst the Podkolzins, Garlands, Bessers, Hoaglanders, and maybe even the Pearsons will be the odd men or two out. With the top six, you're kind of already set in stone there. Mikheyev, Bavillier, Kuzmenko, all these guys are going to be there, and then if you rotate around some of the other names, Besser, Garland, etc., it makes things a little bit more difficult to try to fill out confidently. And so when it comes to the Canucks trying to trade away some guys, opening up space, not just on their salary cap, but on the roster in general, it's going to be an interesting juggle to see who gets the axe and who sticks around. Because even without these guys, Garland, Pud Colson, Hoaglander, Besser, Pearson, you still have other names that are rotating around. Phil DiGiuseppe's around there. Dakota Joshua is an extra option. We'd already seen Rick Tockett have some pretty good praise towards Pud Colson and Hoaglander, two younger guys in the organization that will probably be relied upon longer term. So are they automatically placed into the lineup? Do you give them a spot just because they're younger and have more to show for in the next few years? Or do you try to prioritize having the best lineup available? Hey, screw it, we're going to put Garland in the third line, and Besser is going to be also kind of rotating around there because we want to be competitive, we want to win, we want to do all this stuff, and if Tanner Pearson is able to come into the lineup, then hey, he's taking up a spot too. It's going to be tough seeing the Canucks navigate the cap space situation with Pearson enabled, but it's also going to be equally important seeing them balance out the wingers. There are just too many gosh darn guys on this team, and heading into next season... I mean, I think the Canucks definitely do have it in them to be more competitive and actually find themselves in a playoff spot race. I say playoff spot race, wild card race, you could probably say. But you have to do some balancing beforehand, and that's not going to be easy. So, all signs, based off of everything we've been hearing from all these insiders, it all kind of forms a similar conclusion. Like, if you had to map everything out and see what's possible for this team as options towards the start of the year, they almost all involve the same thing. Somebody is going to get traded. One of these wingers is going to be on the move. One or two of these guys have to free up other spots for other players. And sure, it's good to have depth, but when you have so much depth that you have NHL caliber guys sitting out because they just don't have any room, that's where things get a little bit complicated and you have to start to question whether or not you're doing this in the most profitable way. So, if you're a Canucks fan, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. How do you feel about Pearson coming back? We haven't really made any conversations on the channel about this, but I definitely have had my fair share of conversations with other people talking about Pearson. Long story short, based off of what I'm hearing, you know, this peer testimony, what people seem to be thinking about in this community, a lot of people don't really believe that the Pearson's going to be able to play, and um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if Pearson was still in shape, like, you don't really need your hand to go out there and skate, so who knows how much he's been training throughout the past little while he's been out, but uh, yeah, the hand stuff, that's pretty dangerous and serious as well, especially since we had had all the reports of his surgery going so extraordinarily wrong. But of course, you know, no matter what happens, we all hope that Tanner Pearson as a human being is able to recover and live his life in the proper ways. It's just if that coincides with him being available as a Vancouver Canucks option, then we'll see where exactly the team goes with that. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. How do you feel about Tanner Pearson's potential return with Vancouver? And how do you feel about the situation at the wing? Hoaglander, Pud Colson, Besser, Garland... One, two of these guys on the move. Who really knows? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed this. Vrishash Rolls 99. And bye. <laughs>